بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد So today is a lot less people I think I did scare them off last lesson even though we still did a lesson I wasn't that strict right um, and because you guys are brave enough to attend inshallah the revision will be a lot easier for you guys inshallah uh, but just quickly, just for the sake of revision, so that it sticks in our heads, right? Iman, linguistically, and is, linguistically, what is it? Uh, to believe and confirm with contentment. To believe and confirm with contentment. And uh, Islamically? It's speech and action. Speech and action. Speech and action of what? Uh, speech of the heart, action of the tongue, uh, action, speech of the heart, speech of the tongue, action of the uh, heart, action of the lips. Good. So, uh, speech of the heart and the tongue, and actions of the heart and the and the limbs. Do you guys need this? No, it's going to, it's going to turn it off. Unless there's someone in the room. Where? Sisters. No, there's no sisters. Oh, no, check the telegram call. Yeah, there's no one. No, there's no one. Okay, so we don't need it. Um, so, okay, that was regarding that. And then, okay, what were the principles of Ahl Sunnah? The first principle, uh, that Iman is speech. Iman is speech and action. Give me one proof, any proof. Um, the first 11 ayat of Surah, I'm uh, good. The second principle. Uh, the back, the back. <coughs> Iman increases and decreases. So the last lesson was basically just based on that. The Iman increases and that Iman um, decreases, right? So, in short, in summary, how does Iman increase and decrease? Over here? With the more good actions you do. More good actions, no, and the uh, sins it goes on. Right, which factors do we mention regarding? Uh, good deeds. So, uh, quality of the action. Quality of the action. Um, so that's the sincerity, uh, the type of action. Sincerity and? Um, one more, one more. Sunnah. Uh, I'm following the sunnah now. Uh, type of action. Type of action. Uh, the amount of action. And the amount of action. Yeah. Yeah, good. Um, what about mm, the factors that affect the uh, iman decreasing? Is, Any other? Uh, uh, being heedless. Being heedless. Um, two are the same. Type of action. Type of action and the amount. Them two are the same as. Yeah. Yeah, so one left. One more. Yeah. Strength of the call. Oh, the strength of the call. Oh, you beat me. <laughs> strength of the, uh, strength of the call. Okay, yeah. If a believer uh, does a sin, then his heart needs to be in one of three states. Riyad, mention one of them. Uh, hate the action. H hate the sin. Um, fear the punishment. Fear the punishment. And desire for hope. Hope uh, for the forgiveness, right. Give me some actions that increase a person's demand more than others. Uh, Fundable the Quran. Fundable the Quran. Sorry? One action. Give me a few. Fundable the Quran, seeking knowledge. Knowledge. Uh, having patience. Patience. Enjoying good forbidden even. Okay, that's fine. Right. Okay, let's start today's lesson, inshallah. So we're on page 173. Page 17, 173, yeah? Now, okay. On page 173, the third principle, which in reality, uh, if you understand the second principle, then the third principle makes sense. The third principle makes sense. Which is that the believers, their levels of Iman are different. Not everyone's level of Iman is the same. And the Iman and Mu'minina mutafawitun. That the Iman of the believers are different levels. And what are the levels of Iman? The Iman, uh, the, gen the general levels of Iman are three. Generally, levels of Iman are, are three. Firstly, we have Aslul Iman. 
Aslul Iman means the foundations of Iman. It means the foundations of Iman. Then we have Kamalul Iman Al Wajib. What does what Kamal mean? Oh, any Arabic students? Completeness. No. Kamal al Iman, the completeness of Iman, Al Wajib, uh, is obligatory Iman. So the second one means the completeness of the obligatory Iman. The second one means the completeness of the obligatory Iman. And the third one is Kamal al Iman al Mustahab, i.e., the completeness of the recommended Iman. The completeness of the recommended Iman. So we have the foundations of Iman, number one. Number two, the completeness of the obligatory Iman. And number three, the completeness of the recommended Iman. So these are three levels. What are the three levels? Uh, what are the proof for them? So I mentioned one ayah, one hadith. As for the ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, ثُمَّ أَوْرَثْنَا الْكِتَابَ الَّذِينَ اصْطَفَيْنَا مِنْ عِبَادِنَا uh, That we have given the book as inheritance to certain slaves فَمِنْهُمْ from them ظَالِمٌ لِنَفْسِهِ those that oppress themselves وَمِنْهُمْ مُقْتَصِدٌ and those who are in the middle وَمِنْهُمْ سَابِقٌ بِالْخَيْرَاتِ and those who uh, are the foremost in good deeds okay ذَلِكُ uh, وَالْفَضُ الْكَبِيرُ so we have those that oppress themselves those in the middle and those that surpass others in good deeds Notice, Allah says, ثُمَّ أَوْرَثْنَا الْكِتَابَ الَّذِينَ اصْطَفَيْنَا مِنْ عِبَادِنَا From our slaves. So what is understood is that these people are all believers. But فَمِنْهُمْ ظَالِمٌ لِنَفْسِهِ Those that oppress themselves, they are the lowest level, which is أصل الإيمان. Then you have مُقْتَصِد, which is the second one. كَمَالِ الْإِيمَانِ الْوَاجِبِ And then you have سَابِقٌ بِالْخَيْرَاتِ Those who are foremost in good deeds. They are uh, the third level. كَمَالِ الْإِيمَانِ المستحب. The completeness of the Recommended Iman Okay So as you can see In this ayah as well This ayah is talking about believers so, And it mentions the three levels as well And then from the Sunnah The Messenger Sallallahu uh, Alaihi Wasallam Is also understood as well So the Prophet had a dream And he said that um, In this dream he saw different, The Prophet saw different people And they all had shirts of different sizes Some had short Some had longer But then he saw Umar radiallahu anh, And his shirt was dragging like it was dragging onto the floor basically. Really, really long. So the companions asked the Messenger of Allah وسلم, how do you interpret this dream or what does the dream mean? And he said, uh, Ad-Deen. It is the religion. Ayy Umar radiallahu an, he's surpassing everybody else in terms of his in terms of his religion. And if I'm not mistaken, there is another narration that mentions al ilm knowledge as well. Okay, and the, the dream is slightly different. Um, I think it was regarding drinking milk, that when he was drinking milk it was overflowing. Uh, uh, what does this hadith show us? It shows us that if the shirt of every single person in that dream was the level of the religion, that everyone's level was, was different, with Umar عن, having the highest level of the, of the religion. So these two hadith, or sorry, this hadith and this ayah shows us what? It's a proof to show that the levels of the believers are, are different. And as for the ayah, that clearly shows the three levels that we have split it into. Right? And just to repeat one more time, just so the, the, the comments know what we're talking about, we're on page 173. That the Iman of the believers are different levels, three levels. The first is Aslul Iman, the foundation of Iman. The second is the completeness of the obligatory Iman. And the third is the completeness of the recommended Iman. The first is the foundations of Iman. The second, the completeness of the recommended, uh, the second is the completeness of the obligatory Iman. And the third is the completeness of the recommended Iman. Foundations of Iman, completeness of obligatory Iman, and Third is completeness of the recommended Iman. So we mentioned the proofs for these three. We mentioned the proofs for these these three. Now we're going to come to the explanation. It says here, explanation of the three levels of Iman. Know that the three levels are the same as the three levels of the religion. I.e. the three levels of Iman are the same as the three levels of the, of the religion. So when we have Asl Iman, that is basically the level of Islam. And we said the completeness of the obligatory Iman, then that is basically Al-Iman. 
uh, Islam Iman. And then when we said the completeness of the recommended Iman, that is the level of Ihsan. So it's basically the same. It's basically the same. So we have Islam Iman Ihsan, Asl Iman, Kamal Al Iman Al Wajib, Kamal Al Iman Al Mustahab is basically the same. Like they mirror one another. They mirror one another. But if you go into a bit more detail regarding Iman, how the ulama rahimahullah explain these three, uh, these three levels? Okay. Now, what it means by foundations of Iman is a person, if he has a foundation of Iman, it means that he has general Iman which enters him, him, enters him into the religion. He has general Iman that enters him into the religion. And in this level, those that commit major sins and so on also enter into this, uh, into this level. Or even those that maybe leave, uh, leave off obligations, they enter into this level. Or new Muslims, they will enter into this, this level. And that's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Hujarat, ayah number 14, Surah Al-Hujarat, ayah number 14, Allah subhanahu, subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, قَالَتِ الْأَعْرَابُ آمَنَّا That the Bedouins, they said, we have Iman. قُلْ لَمْ تُؤْمِنُوا وَلَكِنْ قُولُوا أَسْلَمْنَا And Allah tells them off, He said, say to them that, uh, uh, قُلْ لَمْ تُؤْمِنُوا Say, you, ha you don't have Iman. وَلَكِنْ قُولُوا أَسْلَمْنَا But say you have Islam. I.e. You're not on the second level yet. You're still on the first level. The level of, of Islam. وَلَمَّا يَدْخُلِ الْإِيمَانُ فِي قُلُوبِكُمْ The level of Iman has not entered into your hearts fully, fully yet. Okay? So, this is the first level, foundation of Iman. That it enters a person into Islam. And obviously, if you look at the three levels of the religion, this is the same as the level of Islam. Then we have the second level, which is the level of Kamal al-Iman, Al-Wajib The completeness of the obligatory Iman Which is in the ayah known as Al-Muqtasid It was in the middle The first one was Those that oppress themselves And the second is Muqtasid Those in the middle These are those people That on top of the first level They come with that which is obligatory And they stay away from that which is Haram That which is forbidden They do that which is obligatory And they stay away from that which is forbidden <coughs> and if they fall into sin, because every every human, every Muslim, you know, falls into sin, makes mistakes. But if they do fall into sin, then they hasten to tawbah. If they do fall into sin, then they hasten to tawbah, to repentance. Uh, you know, definition for uh, they do completeness of iman. So they do obligatory actions, and they they stay away from um, major sins, or they don't do major sins. What's that? What's the difference between stay away and don't do? And don't do is you don't do at all, but stay with you, try. No, you um, don't do, don't do. Don't do. Yeah. yeah. Same thing. And this, if you look at the three levels of the religion, corresponds with the level of Iman. Then we come to the third. Kamal al-Iman al-Mustahab. The completeness of the recommended Iman. And this is those people, on top of doing that which is obligatory, they also do, the, do that which is mustahab, that which is recommended. And uh, on top of staying away from that which is impermissible, they also stay away from that which, that which is disliked. And we can also add, they stay away from many of the things which are permissible as well. They stay away from many of the permissible things as well. I'll explain that in a second. So the first level is that general iman that enters them into the religion. The second level, they do that which is obligatory and stay that which is away from that which is haram. And if they do fall into it, then they do tawbah. And then the third level, those that do that which is obligatory and recommended and stay away from that which is impermissible, disliked, and many of the permissible actions. And this level corresponds with the level of, which level? Ihsan. Ihsan. Now why do we say stay away from Many of the permissible actions. Who wants to try to answer that question? I was 
Oke. Okay. Oke. Okay. Oke. Okay. Right. So one answer is obviously it's a waste of time and we're going to be asked about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala regarding our time. time. Also it goes against Muru as well. But also when a person indulges too much into things which are permissible then that is a way of shaitan. You know, he can use that slowly, slowly to d divert you away from other things later on. So if a person, he's got free time, right? And in that free time, he ends up spending in the way of Allah, in something which is good, right? Then it's a lot harder for shaitan to attack him. If a person ends up wasting his time all the time, wasting his time, wasting his time, wasting his time, then that's going to make you firstly lose out on all the reward that he could have got. And secondly, what happens when you waste time? You end up becoming lazy. And then you might end up leaving something which is obligatory. Or if he's wasting time on your phone, if you're always on your phone, then you may end up just clicking on something which is haram, for example. Right, and so on. So when a person wastes his time, even if that which is permissible, right, then that, that's actually, that's, that's like the last resort of shaitan. And if you can't make you do major shirk, and you can't make you do minor shirk, and you can't make you do innovations, you can't make you do major sins, and not minor sins, then he makes you waste your time with that which is permissible. Okay, because... That was he takes away from you doing good deeds, and it's also easier for him to um, attack you by either making you leave off that which is obligatory, or slowly, slowly, you know, waiting for you to err. It's like it's like you're walking on the edge of a boundary. Imagine you had a boundary, or uh, imagine a football pitch, right? You're on the uh, uh, on the sideline, and you've got the ball with you. It's perm it's permissible in the sense that you've got the ball; the ball's not going to play, but you slip, the ball goes out of your control, right? It's going to go out for a throw in, right? Yeah? Football terms not understand. Right? Same thing. But if you're, if you're doing stuff in the middle of the pitch, other players are there, but in terms of the ball going out, it's not going to go out, is it? Right? So that's similar um, over here. Right. There is um, other terminologies, two other terminologies, which I've written here in Arabic. By the way, do you guys have the worksheets or no? Then the lesson's gonna be a lot harder for you. Huh? If you don't have the worksheets, you need the worksheets. I'm going off on the worksheets. If sometimes I, if I go through something quick, it's because it's written here. Yeah. <coughs> Sorry? No, there's no sharing. You have to uh, oh. message Naeem and sign up. And he'll add you into the group. Right. He'll add you into the group. And uh, in that group, every... Today I didn't because we didn't do much last week. But every week I update it. So whatever lesson we're doing, I'll make it. And then I'll update it and send it. And then it's up to you if you're going to print it straight away. Or if you just want to use the PDF, that's up to you. So what chance, could you say the third principle is that there's three levels of prohibition? Imagine. It, it, is, it is. But we're talking about Iman, so... Uh, the other when, it, when they talk about Iman in the books, they use these terminologies. Okay, they, they, won't, they won't really use Islam, Iman, and Ihsan. That's why you need to understand these terminologies. And that's why I've had this other question, because some ulama uh, use these other words. The question here is, what is the difference between Mutlaqul Iman and al iman al mutlaq Anyone heard these words before? Mutlaqul Iman and al iman al mutlaq Real? You don't know what it means. Right. These are two words. Mutlaqul Iman means Aslul Iman, the foundation of Iman. So instead of saying Aslul Iman, you might hear in some other books of the Salaf saying Mutlaqul Iman. And then Al Imanul Mutlaq means Al Imanul Kamil, complete Iman. It means complete Iman. And it, could, and it can include both, either the completeness of the obligatory Iman or the recommended Iman. Okay, and that's very uh, important. That a person, he focuses on completing his Iman and not just sufficing with Aslul Iman. 
And those people who are on the level of Kamal al-Iman, the completeness of Iman, whether it's obligatory or even better mustahab, then they are the awliya of Allah. They are the awliya of Allah. And I mentioned the hadith over here with the person he says, I'll summarize the hadith, but it's over there for you to read. That and it's also hadith number 38 in this book. Inshallah, I'll take it later. Um, that my slave doesn't come closer to me with anything except with that which I have made obligatory upon me. And in the beginning of the hadith, Allah Subhanahu says, "Man whoever wages war against my wali, declares war against my wali." I think the English translation says, "Pious worshipper." Yeah, so now I'm gonna change that to wali because that's what we're talking about. <coughs> Yeah. Okay. So the, the, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says in the beginning of this hadith that whoever wages war against my wali, then he explains later on who is the wali, and he says my slave doesn't closer to me with anything except which I have made obligatory, and then he co he continues coming closer to me with that which I have made mustahab recommended. So he shows that whoever is on the level of the obligatory iman, the completeness of obligatory iman, or completeness of the recommended iman, then he is from the awliya of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Now. Um, I'll give you an example, right? You might be thinking, oh, too many technical words, oh, what's the benefit of this? Uh, obviously, one is that when you read the books of the Salaf and other books, inshallah, later on, you'll understand these terminologies. Secondly, it helps you understand and uh, many uh, answers to many issues as well. For example, if I said to you, what's the ruling? I'm asking two questions, two questions, yeah? And then think of the answer and then let me know. I don't want anyone answering until I say answer. The first question is, what is the ruling on having an ounce of love for the Prophet What's the ruling on having an ounce of love for the Prophet I think I've, I've asked this question before. No? Okay. The second is, what is the ruling on loving the Prophet more than anybody else? The first is, what's the ruling of having an ounce of love for the Prophet And the second is, what is the ruling on having love of the Prophet more than anybody else? See, so two questions here are different, right? One's about just having some sort of love, and the other question is loving the Prophet more than everybody else. So, what's the answer to the first one? Good. Aslul Iman. It's from Aslul Iman. The ruling on having an ounce of love, some sort of love for the Prophet is from the foundations of Iman, which without a person is not a believer. A person doesn't have any love for the Prophet, or if he even hates the Prophet, how can he be a Muslim? He's not a Muslim. Okay, what about loving the Prophet ﷺ more than everybody else? Obligatory or recommended? Obligatory. Obligatory. Kamal al-Iman al-Wajib. Yeah, that's why Umar radiallahu anh, when the Prophet ﷺ said this to him, and he, he said that I love everyone, more, uh, I love you more than everyone apart from myself. Prophet said, you don't truly believe. And then he rectified his intention and so on. And then he said, okay, I love you more than everybody else. And then Prophet said, al -an ya Umar. Now you have this complete Iman. Now you have this complete Iman. So you can see that these, you know, it helps us understand. Yeah. So that is loving the Prophet more than everybody else. And then com the completeness of the recommended Iman would be, so the first was loving, having an ounce of love. The second is having love more than everybody else. But the third would be just the highest level of Iman that you can have. That you just love the person of, uh, due to his mannerisms, due to how he was, and you just love him you know, way more than uh, everybody else. That would be like the mustahab uh, level, and that you can just go higher and higher. No. Yeah. It's hadith number 38 in this book. Hadith number 38 in this book. And it's in uh, narrated by Bukhari. Hadith Abu Hurairah. Um, actually, there are other references here. Yes, uh, Bukhari hadith number 6137. Bukhari 6137. Right, note uh, what we said. Uh, the note is. That these the splitting of three levels that we did is a general splitting. It's general. 
Uh, otherwise, everyone individually is, you know, can be different places, they can be fluctuating. Maybe in certain beliefs or certain actions are on a certain level and other actions are on a different level, right? So in detail, it'll differ, but what we're talking about is just a general, uh, general splitting, a general division. Right, we have uh, on the next page now uh, a couple of issues before we finish talking about Iman. We have a couple of extra issues right, regarding Iman. Now, we're not going to go into, uh, sorry, Riyadh, we're not going to go into the different sects. Uh, reason being is because if I do it now, then I'll have to do it for every single issue, and then that's just going to be too long. I want to try to stay consistent, uh, and especially because I know many of you, maybe it's the first time studying this book. Uh, never mind, you know, some of you might have not studied an Aqeedah book before or anything So it'll be too much as well Okay, so in the future we can go into the other sects Right now, we are mentioning details, there's details of what you all have to believe So at least solidify our own belief first Later, we can talk about other sects and everything But at least we can solidify what we have to believe in uh, first, inshallah Right, this issue is known as al istisnau fil Iman Anyone know what this issue is referring to? Istisna in Iman No? Mm. no? Right. Al istisna and Iman is basically is it permissible for you to say, I am a mu'min and I, I have Iman, insha'Allah. Insha'Allah. Are you allowed to say that when you're talking about Iman? Yes. Okay. Right. What do you say? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. Put your hand up and say yeah. Alright. <laughs> and put your hand up and say no. Put your hand up and say anything else. It depends. It depends. Right. The only one in the Madhab Ahlul Sunnah is Riyadh. Everyone else is Ahlul Bidah. <laughs> right. Those that said yes. Yeah, you guys are on the madhab of the Sha'ira and those that said no on the madhab of the Maturidiyya Right, we don't need to go into what they say Ahl Sunnah, they say <laughs> They say It's permissible Depending on uh... Wait, did you read? What you said? No, no, I, I knew before Okay, 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 good, right, right let, Let's read what you said, let's read what I've, I've written I've not done the answer Okay um, It's okay, you know, this is it's okay, you don't actually have to live with that, don't worry. Yeah? It's for discussions, it's a lot. And it's not, you're not giving a fatwa, it's for discussion. Uh, and that's, that's completely fine, yeah? Right, it says here in the worksheet, if you had the worksheet, you could read, but Father Allah. Ahlul Sunnah believe it is impermissible to do so in some scenarios. Sorry, I meant to mean permissible. It is permissible to do so in some scenarios and impermissible in others. Ahl Sunnah believe it is permissible to do so in some scenarios and impermissible in other uh, in other scenarios. Okay? So the question is when is it when is it permissible? When is it permissible? It is per okay, why did you say yeah? I heard you say it once. You heard me say it once. <laughs> <laughs> right. Anyone else want to give you an, uh, an answer? Good, you have to have certain belief, right? We're going to come to when it's not permissible. But firstly, we're going to talk about when is it permissible. It is permissible when a person intends al iman al mutlaq. I'm going to use a technical term. When a person intends al iman al mutlaq. Right. Before I explain what it is, I'll allow you write that. Right. I'll say to you now, right? And let's just use the ayah of the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Qad aflah al mu'minun. The believers are successful. Alladhina hum fi salatihim khashi'un. They have khashu' in the salah. Walladhina hum an illaghu mu'ridun. They stay away from idle talk. They don't waste their time idle talk or backbiting or anything like that. Walladhina hum lizzakati fa'ilun. They always pay their zakah on the time. Walladhina hum al-furuji muhafidun. They always protect their private parts. They don't fall into any form of zina. Right? Until the end of the ayah. And then let's add some other stuff. A, a believer is somebody who prays at night, making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, begging him to enter them into paradise. 
and to forgive their sins. And a believer is the one who realizes the importance of uh, Islamic knowledge. Therefore, he tries to attain the inheritance of the prophets. Right, now I ask you the question, are you a believer? Be honest, what do you say? Yeah? What do you say? Yeah, it's everything I said you do. You try, but you don't do everything. All right. If the intent is a person who has complete Iman, then it's permissible to say, insha'Allah. It's permissible to say, uh, insha'Allah. If you intend al Iman, as Muslim, complete Iman. Right? And what is complete Iman? The things that I mentioned. That every salah you pray, you pray with full khushur, you're praying in Qiyamul Layl, you're reciting Quran every single day, or you know, doing so many things, right? All the things that Islam commands us and staying away from everything which Islam tells us to stay away from, as they explain in the meaning of Kamal, Al Iman, Al Wajib, and Mustahab, right? Why is it permissible? It's permissible for a number of reasons, okay? Firstly, Al Iman al Mutlaq necessitates that you do everything Allah has commanded you to do. And you stay away from everything Allah has prohibited us from doing. And no one can say that we do that 100%. Right? Do everything Allah has commanded us and stay away from every single thing that uh, Allah has prohibited us from doing. You know, sometimes we lack in our salah, sometimes we fall into sin. Right? So no one can say 100% I do everything that Allah has commanded me to do and 100% I stay away from everything that He has prohibited me from doing. And that's why Imam Ahmad, I've written the narration here. You know, Ahmad was asked regarding this and he said, we have come with speech. We say that we have Iman. We say Tawheed and Sunnah. But we fear that we are deficient in actions. Therefore, I like to read Al-Istithna, which is saying, I am a believer, inshaAllah. Okay? The second reason why it is permissible is, let's say, even if we do everything, we don't know if it's going to be accepted or not. So the second aspect is that we don't know if it's going to be accepted. And that's the most important part. The most important part is not putting in the effort, it's if it's going to be accepted by Allah. No point in doing something and it's not going to be accepted. Like the example of the one who prays 10 hours at night, we prayed without wudu. Is it going to be accepted? No, so, the, so it's not about just doing the actions, it's about being accepted by Allah subhanahu uh, wa ta'ala. And again, nobody can say all my actions are accepted. Even the ones that we do, we don't do all of them, but even the ones that we do, we can't say even they are accepted. I mean, just think of Isha Salah. That we just prayed. Can you say 100% you prayed with 100% khushur? Right? Um, and that's why, subhanAllah, I believe it was it, you know, the ayah, uh, ayah surah Ma'idah, I've not written it down, but, إِنَّمَا يَتَقَبَّلُ اللَّهُ مِنَ الْمُتَّقِينَ Allah SWT says, He only accepts from those that have taqwa. I believe it might have been Umar رضي الله عنه. I might check the tafsir of this ayah. But he said something along the lines of, that I hope that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even accepts one of my actions. Why? Because he, if he accepts one, then that means I'm from the muttaqin. Because Allah does not accept unless you're from the muttaqin. SubhanAllah. Right? So, the, what's important is the acceptance of our actions. There's an ayah over here. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَالَّذِينَ يُؤْتُونَ مَا آتَوْ وَقُلُوبُهُمْ وَجِلَةٌ أَنَّهُمْ إِلَىٰ رَبِّهِمْ رَاجِعُونَ And those who give, you know, the charity which, uh, which they give with their hearts full of fear. They give zakah whilst their hearts are full of fear um, because they are surely going to return to their Lord. The Prophet ﷺ explained the meaning of, of this ayah. Aisha anha asked the Messenger وسلم, about this ayah. Um, she said, Are those who drink alcohol and steal, meaning those people that give zakah and in the fear, they still have that fear of Allah, are they those people that drink alcohol, steal, because obviously doing so many sins, are they the ones who are fearful as well? Right? As for somebody who's always doing righteous deeds, you know, it makes sense if he's not fearful because he's doing the righteous deeds. So Aisha asks this question, that those people who have this fear, are they those that drink alcohol and steal? The Prophet said, no, O daughter of a Siddiq. They are those who fast, perform salah, change that to salah, give charity, while they fear that their Lord will not accept it from them. It is these who hasten to do good deeds, and they are the foremost of them. So this is the second uh, angle of how, uh, you know, why a person cannot 100% say that they are from the believers. And then the third reason, the next page, is بُعْدًا عَنِ التَّزْكِيَةِ That it keeps a person far away from self-praise. 
It keeps a person far away from self praise. Let me turn this on. Is it better with it on or with it off? Then my main concern was online, how it comes online. I'm gonna check later to see if, if there's a difference. Right, so the third reason is that it keeps a person far away from self praise. Imagine if a person keeps saying, I'm a believer, I do this, I do that. You know, then it could lead to a person having some sort of, some sort of self amazement, pride, and so on. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prohibited us from that. I mentioned the ayah over here. فَلَا تُزَكُّوا أَنفُسَكُمْ Don't do tizki of yourselves. Uh, in the translation, so ascribe not purity to yourselves. Yeah? هُوَ أَعْلَمْ He knows, yani Allah knows, or oh, He knows best, yani Allah knows best, Him who has the most taqwa. So then, with these three points, we, you know, this proves the point that if we are talking about completeness of Iman, or Iman mutlaq if you want to use a technical term, then, it is permissible to say, insha'Allah. The question is, when is it not permissible to say, I am a believer, insha'Allah? Have a guess. Huh? When you're talking about Aslu al Iman. When you're talking about Aslu al Iman. So if somebody says to you, Are you a mu'min or a kafir? What are you going to say? You're going to say mu'min? You're going to say, insha'Allah. There's, there's no doubt in that one. You're, you're, I'm a believer, I'm Muslim, or a mu'min. Okay? So if you're talking about mutlaq uh, al-iman, yeah? The previous one, when is it permissible? When you're talking about al-iman al-mutlaq. Yeah, the previous one was al-iman al-mutlaq, complete iman. And now here we are talking about mutlaq al-iman, the foundations of iman. So, Taha, when is it permissible? <coughs> Foundations of Iman. What's the technical term? <laughs> Mutlaq al Iman. And when is it not permissible? Uh, al Iman al Mutlaq. Completeness of, uh, of Iman. Right? No, no, Other way around, other way around. Yeah. Okay, other way around. Talha, I'm the wrong answer. When is it permissible when you talk about Al Iman al Mutlaq? Complete Iman. And when is it not permissible when you're talking about? Mutlaq al-Iman, Asl iman yeah. Alright, forget the technical terms. It's permissible to say Iman when you talk about complete Iman. It's permissible to say Insha'Allah when you talk about complete Iman. Okay. Your, your Iman is in the same level that Abu Bakr is doing. No. So if I say a believer is and I talk about how Abu Bakr is, then I say, are you a believer? Yes. Are you a believer like Abu Bakr? That's the meaning. No. no. Right? But you just said no now. Okay. But if I say to you, are you a believer or a kafir? In that one you have no shot at all. Do you understand the difference? So when you say Iman al-Mutlaq, mean complete Iman. Let's think of numbers, right? Is your Iman 100%? It's not. We say Inshallah, you Inshallah get to that level. Does that make sense now? Okay? Right. So again, one more time, just in case any slip of tongues and I said the word the wrong way around. Okay, this got a bit confusing. Um, it is permissible to say Inshallah when you are talking about Al-Iman al-Mutlaq, complete Iman. That's when it's permissible. And it's impermissible when you're talking about mutlaq al-iman, asl al-iman, the foundations of iman. If you're getting confused with the Arabic, forget the Arabic, just think of the English. It's permissible when you're talking about the completeness of iman. It's impermissible when you're talking about the foundations of iman. And this is how you understand many of the statements of the Salaf. Because sometimes you'll find statements of the Salaf, you know, one thing, one thing, one thing, another thing. It depends on the intention. It depends on the um, attention. That's why it's very important for a student of knowledge not to just grab one statement of the Salaf and just use that everywhere. But to gather all of them and actually understand what's the intent behind, behind it. Likewise with the ulama. Sometimes the ulama will say a certain ruling, but the intent is just to lay a general foundation and to teach the people what's correct. Even though there might be a certain exceptions, that's not the time to mention the exceptions. But then you can't just take that and just go around everyone saying, look, is every single situation, the scholar didn't make an exception, so therefore there's no exception to that. You have to understand the time and place, and you have to understand what the other ulama said, and put everything together like that. For example, I'll give you an example, right? We took the issue of did the salaf differ in, uh, differ in, uh, in aqidah. Now you'll find many of the ulama, even contemporary, that say they didn't. They didn't. And whoever says they did, uh, misguided and so on. 
They're here laying what? A general foundation. When you're speaking to the general public. Because they don't want any doubts to come to them or anything like that. Right? But now that doesn't mean if you find another scholar say, yeah, the Sahaba differed in this aqidah issue, right? He's dalim madin. No, because what that scholar meant, he laid the general foundation. And that is 98%, 99% of the issues in aqidah. Yeah, if, if I was to put a number to it, a very high number, they all agreed. There were a few small, minute, secondary issues where they differed. That's it. Right? If you look at the Sahaba, uh, so does that make sense? That makes sense to everyone, yeah? Okay. Um, I've got this story of Al uh, Hassan al Basri, I believe. Now, Imam al Bayhaqi narrates that a man asked Hassan al Basri, Are you a mu'min? So he replied, As for me, then I believe in Allah, His angels, His books, His messengers, resurrection after death, and in the divine decree, the good of it and the bad. As for the description that Allah Azza wa has mentioned, the believers are only those who, when Allah is mentioned, feel a fear in their hearts. He read until uh, the ayat. He heard the ayat until it is they who are the believers in truth. For them, are uh, grades of dignity with the Lord and forgiveness and a general, a generous provision and yeah, paradise. There's a number of ayat regarding the descriptions of the believers. He says, "Then I do not know if I am from them or not." Okay, so you can see this is one statement, and he explained the basic the two answers. He said, "As for the belief in the pillars of iman and being a believer, i.e., aslul iman, then yes." But if you're talking about the completeness of Iman, then I don't know. Right? Basically, inshallah. Yeah. You know when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says this? Yeah. When he refers to the believers, is he talking about Aslul Iman or is complete, completeness of Iman in that? Yeah. So he's talking about, yeah. Completeness, yeah. 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 I mean, you have to look at, um, this is obviously, a general answer. Maybe you have to look at the uh, exact ayah as well. Because maybe you can have, uh, you can have one concept. Which, depending on how you explain it, could be both as well. So if he's saying fear, Allah alam actually, Allah alam, you might have to check. Because to have an ounce of fear, you have to have an ounce of fear. You remember we took last time, if your heart doesn't have an ounce of fear, then it could be a hypocrite and so on. But if you're talking about complete fear, then that could be iman and mustahab. Uh, so it depends on the ayah and exactly what the uh, is talking about. But what seems to be the case uh, is that he is referring to the completeness of iman, because that's how Hassan al-Basri Explain the ayah to, to me. Okay. Right, with that, we finished the issue of Al Iman, Al uh, Istisna Fil Iman. Al Istisna Fil Fil Iman. Right, we have uh, two issues left. This one is the benefits of sticking to the methodology of Ahl Sunnah in the chapters of, of Iman. The benefits of sticking to the methodology of Ahl Sunnah in the chapter of of Iman. Okay. The benefits of sticking to the methodology of Ahl Sunnah and the methodology of the Salaf in Iman are many. I'm mentioning this because, obviously I've not mentioned the other sects, but if you understand these benefits, then it's basically also a refutation of why a person shouldn't be studying the other sects, or following, sorry, the other sects. Inshallah, we'll study what they say in the you know, future books, inshallah. The first benefit is that by sticking to their methodology, you are sticking to the texts. You are sticking to the nusus al shariah that's the legislated texts. And as we know, whoever clings on to the text, he will be the one who will attain salvation and be saved from the hellfire. <coughs> the second benefit is that it opens the doors of competition for the highest levels of, of Jannah. The highest levels of Iman and Jannah. Because the other sects, they, they don't say Iman increases and decreases. They say Iman is one thing, everyone's the same. But your Iman can be the same level as Jibreel and Abu Bakr and so on. Right? So, 
Whereas mm-hmm. Ahlul Sunnah say, no, it goes up for now, meaning you, you could easily attain high levels of, of Jannah and of Iman. And then the next benefit is Tanzil al Nasi Manazilahum. You place the people in their correct place. You place the people in their correct place. If you see somebody who's an open sinner, then obviously the, the reality only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows, right? But even with that, you know, if a person is a complete open sinner, then how can he be on the same level as somebody who is always worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Right? There has to be a difference between the two. And that difference is only established if a person follows the methodology of Ahlul Sunnah. Allah says, Abnaja al Muttaqeen al Kalfajar, rhetorical question. So we make those of taqwa, those of Muttaqeen, at the same level as those who are open sinners? A rhetorical question about Allah. The fourth benefit is that it closes the door of false hope. It closes the door of false hope. Meaning, if a person says that it's all one, you know, like the Murji'ah, they say that a person commits a sin, it doesn't affect their Iman. Because Iman is one thing, it doesn't go up and down. But then a person will say, yeah, I'll do as many sins as long as I'm a believer, my Iman is like Jibreel. You know, it's false hope, that's, uh, it's a lie, it's playing around with Iman. So it closes that door. The fifth benefit is it establishes the foundations of Iman for sinners. It establishes the foundations of Iman for sinners. So we have people like the Khawarij, they say, because it's one block, they do the opposite of the Murjiyah. They say, if a person commits a major sin, he's out of the fold of Islam. If a person commits a major sin, he's out of the fold of Islam. And they basically use that to uh, kill Muslims, basically. Because they say, you're no longer a believer, so we can kill you. Whereas Ahlul Sunnah say, no, if you, as long as you have your Tawheed, right, even if you commit sins, right, you're not on the level of Kamal al-Iman, al-Mustahab, no al-Wajib, but at least you've got Asl al-Iman, you're still, you're still a Muslim. You're still a believer, you still have some sort of Iman. And number six is that it opens the door of true hope for sinners and it gets rid of despair. It gets rid of despair. Because it shows that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, uh, uh, if he does more good deeds, his Iman can increase. So he might be low right now, but he can easily go up. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Don't despair from the mercy of Allah. Allah forgives all sins and so on. So if your Iman is low now, no problem. You work hard and it can increase as well. It can increase as well. These are some of the benefits of sticking to the methodology of Ahl Sunnah when it comes to Iman. Um, it gives true hope to sinners. So the, uh, one a couple of points ago was it closes the door of false hope. False hope is where basically do, they do sin, and then they say, yeah, yeah, it's fine. I'm still a believer. Who, you know, my man's complete. No, no, that's lying. Like, the more sins you do, the lower your man's going. It's not high. Okay, you see people, you know, they're doing sin. You advise them. Like, who are you to judge? Well, if you're doing sin, you know, if you were really pious, you wouldn't be doing sin. Obviously, everyone makes mistakes, but people end up using that line. Uh, as a basically to justify what they are doing. That's why a lot of these sects, right? Even if some of these sects might not be there by name, no one will turn, turn around and say, I'm a, a murji'i. Uh, or, they won't come and use this name. But their beliefs are still are still here. Same with the Mu'tazila. There's not really a group that says we're Mu'tazila. There, there are a shayar and stuff. But the beliefs of the Mu'tazila are widespread. Especially in Shi'ism and uh, so many of these other sects. Okay? The Shi'ans believe that it's the same for everyone, they're more on their level. The Shia have their own definition of Iman. Their Iman is to believe in the 12 Imams. And, and so on. They have, they're, they're different. They're different breed. Right. Okay. Uh, so now we come to the last issue for today, inshallah, which is the belief of Ahl Sunnah regarding major sins. Okay. Um, we've got a question here, which is how does this connect with Iman? It connects with Iman in two ways. Um, maybe I should leave space for this actually. It connects with Iman in two ways. Firstly, because obviously committing sins lowers your Iman, decreases your Iman. But secondly, because we have certain groups, i.e. the Khawarij, that say that if you commit a major sin, you're no longer a Muslim. <coughs> if you commit a major sin, you're no longer a Muslim. So like I said, we're not going to go into what the other sects have said, but we want to solidify and establish our belief correctly according to the Quran and Sunnah, what is correct. So that we can believe in that which is correct, and later on we can build on that by adding the other sects later on, insha'Allah. 
So, what is um, <clears throat> so what is the belief of Ahl Sunnah regarding Iman? Now, now, firstly, it says here some scholars have argued that all sins are major and there's no such thing as a minor sin. Right? Um, this is this opinion is refuted by the statement of Allah in Tajdanibu Kabair. If you stay away from the major sins, right until the end of the ayah. Um, so it shows that it's a weak opinion. In reality, sins are split into two. They're split into major and minor. They are split into major and minor. So this is the first point, establishing that it's split into major and minor. But I want you to think of maybe the reason why they say all, all are major. Because I, I mentioned this for a reason. Um, and I'm going to add on to it as well. Okay, I'm going to read to you the statement of Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah. And uh, Subhan is quite powerful when you do think about it, right? He says, Ibn Qayyim says in Madarij al Salikim, Sins divide into major and minor, uh, divide into minor and major due to the wording of the Quran, the Sunnah, and consensus of the Salaf. Sins divide into minor and major. With the wording, and it's not something which is understood like it's clear wording of the Quran, the Sunnah, and the consensus of the Salaf. اعتبار, and i'tibar basically by logic as well. Like logic, if you think about it, not all the sins are the same. Then he mentions a few ayat and he says, Allah Ta'ala which is the ayah that I've mentioned here. Uh, and he mentions another ayah. Uh, those that stay away from the major sins. This Surah Najm Ayah uh, 32 And he says In the authentic hadith of Prophet He said As-salat al-khams al-jum'a ila jum'a wa ramadan ila ramadan Mukaffirat lima baynahunna Iza shtunimat al-kabair That Five daily prayers and the jum'a to a jum'a And the ramadan to a ramadan Is an expiation for a person's sins As long as he stays away from the major sins All of this shows what? That there's ayat and there's a hadith showing that It's major or minor Then he says وَأَمَّا مَا يُحْكَى عَنْ أَبِي إِسْحَاقَ الْإِسْفَرَايِينِ As for what has been narrated upon Abu Ishaq al-Isfarayini أَنَّهُ قَالَ He has said أَذْذُنُوبُ كُلُّهَا كَبَائِرُ That all sins are major وَلَيْسَ فِيهَا سَغَائِرُ And there's no such thing as minor sins فَلَيْسَ مَرَادُهُ أَنَّهَا مُسْتَوِيَةَ فِي الْإِثْمِ He doesn't mean that they are all the same in terms of sin. He doesn't mean they're all in same in terms of sin. So you see Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah, he's not considering the statement as a separate statement, separate opinion. Say so, no, no, no. He still means the same as what we mean, but his intent by that statement is slightly different. So what's his intent? He says, فَلَيْسَ مُرَادُهُ أَنَّهَا مُسْتَوِيَ فِي الْإِثْمِ The intent is not that they are all the same in sin. بِحَيْثُ يَكُونَ إِثْمُ النَّظَرِ الْمُحَرَّمِ كَإِثْمِ الْوَطْئِ فِي الْحَرَامِ Such as that looking at haram is not, you know, looking at something haram is the same as doing that which is haram. He said that that's not the intent. وَإِنَّمَا الْمُرَادِ مراد the intent is if you look at who the one uh, the one who is being uh, disobeyed is Allah then everything is major now, when you're doing a sin even if it's minor who are you going against you're going against Allah when you look at that how can you look at something being minor right, I'll give you an example right if your friend tells you to do something Right? And you don't do it. Big thing or minor? It's like a general thing, go go do this. You want something simple as go get me a chair. And you don't do it. Yeah, get yourself. Right? Is that a major issue or minor? Minor. Right? If your teacher says to you, get the chair and you don't do it, you don't get it. Major or minor? I'm not talking about major sin, I'm talking about like is it a, <laughs> I'm just talking like as, as an issue, is it a major issue or minor? It's more major than thing. Right. If Sheikh Salih Fawzan came and he said, Get me that chair, and he said, No, nah, can't bother. Right? Now, is that major or minor issue? <laughs> That's quite major. Quite major. Right? So, but why is it major? The, the thing being said is all the same. Go get a chair. There's, there's no, it's not obligatory for you to get a chair. 
generally. Yeah? But the person who's told you now to do it, or the station of that person, the respect of that person, the rights of that person, is maybe a major issue. Like, honestly, if you, there's a big gathering, yeah, and if I said, if I said, Kabir, go give me that chair, and you said no, everyone will give you a look. Yeah, and they'll probably tell you off after as well. But if your brother said to you, give me a chair, and you said, no, do one, get yourself. Right? No one's going to say anything to you. They'll probably laugh and that's it. Yeah? Why? Okay. And obviously, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, walillahi al masal ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the best example. So he's saying that when he meant the all major, i.e., from the aspect of who you are disobeying. Yeah? He said, وَمَا عَهَدَ فَبَعْضُهَا أَكْبَرُ مِنْ بَعْضُ وَمَا عَهَدَ فَالْأَمْرُ فِي ذَلِكَ لَغْضِ لَا يَرْجُعُ إِلَى مَعْنًا He said, with this being said, obviously some are more major than others and the issue here is لَغْضِ like the khilaf is the same wording they both intend the same thing because they both, when, when, when uh, Abu Ishaq al-Isra'ini when he said they're all major he's talking about something else he's not talking about sin he's talking about who you are disobeying okay um There is a statement of Sheikh uh, Samuel Taymiyyah rahimahullah, I'll quickly read that as well. He says, وَمَنْ قَالَ إِنَّهَا سُمِّيَتْ كَبَائِ وَنِسْمَةِ إِلَا مَا دُونَهَا وَإِنْ إِنَّمَا عُصِيَ بِهِ فَهُوَ كَبِيرَةً فَإِنَّهُ يَجِبُ أَنْ لَا تَكُونَ ذْنُوبُ فِي نَفْسِهَا تَنْقَسِمِ إِلَا كَبَائِرَ وَصَغَيْرَ وَهَذَا خِلَافُ الْقُرْآنِ Whoever says that they are... Uh, uh, said basically they're not split into major and minor, and rather they're all major, uh, then that would necessitate is that is a, this goes against the Quran? Then he mentions a number of ayat Surah Najm 32, Surah Shura 37, Nisa 31, Kaha 49, Qawm 53, and so on. Anyways, um, we've established the point that sins do split into major and minor, and that's by Ijma' the Salaf. And according to Ibn Qayyim, the one, even the one who opposed, you know, he intended something different. He didn't intend uh, in terms of sin like we are talking about now. Right. Now that we've Established that sins are split into major and minor. What is the definition of a major sin? What is the definition of a major sin? Now, I'm going to mention to you three um, definitions, and each of them get more concise and concise, smaller and smaller, right? The first one is being narrated by Ibn Abbas, and others from the Salaf. He says, هِيَ كُلُّ ذَمِّنْ خَاتَمَهُ اللَّهُ بِنَارٍ أَوْ لَعْنَةٍ أَوْ غَضَبٍ أَوْ عَذَابٍ أَوْ حَدٍ He said, it is every sin which has been stamped by Allah with fire with fire or curse or anger or punishment or capital punishment every sin which has been stamped by Allah with fire curse anger punishment or capital punishment what does that mean? stamped by Allah I, Allah SWT has said that this sin will have this punishment and either that punishment could be nar that you be in the hellfire or la'na that this person is cursed for example Allah al May the curse of Allah be upon the those that lie. Or ghadab. Or if a person does this ang, uh, this action, he gains the anger of Allah. Or azab. Or any other punishment in the akhirah. Or had capital punishment. Right, so if you do this, then you know uh, you're killed or you're executed or or anything like that. If any of the any of the sins come under any of these things mentioned here, then it's considered a major sin. Then it's considered a major sin. No. You lie about something minor. Okay. There's another. Can I ask something? Yeah. Is the quantity of the minor uh, can be equalized with uh, uh, one uh, major? We mentioned this before. I think I mentioned. Was it last lesson? Yeah? And there is a principle that the ulama mentioned. That is, لا كبيرة مع الاستغفار ولا صغيرة مع الاستمرار. That no such thing as a major sin with repentance. <coughs> a person repents, right? He, that, that sin is wiped out. ولا صغيرة مع الاستمرار. 
and then no such thing as a minus in if it's continuous. Person constantly again and again and again and again and again every single day, he's just doing that sin, right? Then it becomes a major sin. Because it shows that there's no fear of Allah left in that sin. So it's like doing a major sin. And it's mentioned by books of Aqidah, it's mentioned in uh, in Hadith as well, when they talk about who's a trustworthy narrator. So it's, person commits a major sin, he's still trustworthy. Because uh, Sorry, a minor sin, he's still trustworthy. <coughs> but if he's constantly doing trustworthy, every single day you see him doing a, a minor sin. Right? Then it's as though it goes to the level of major sin. Right, the second definition is by Al-Mawardi in his book Al-Hawi. He says, هِيَ مَا وَجَبَتْ فِيهِ الْحُدُودِ أو توجه إليه الوعيد. It is what necessitates or is what obligates capital punishments or a punishment in the hereafter. So he's basically summarized the previous one. Either a capital punishment in this world or some sort of punishment in the hereafter. Right? That's a major sin. <coughs> and Sheikh Al Asaymi, I saw a video of his, Masha Nabwi, and he mentioned this. In, in the Dora as well, but I can't remember uh, which lesson. Might have been quite fiqhia. Anyways, he, his, def, his definition was مَا نُهِيَ عَنْ وَجْهِ التَّعْظِيمِ What has been prohibited in a venerated form? What has been prohibited in a venerated form? What does that mean? What has been prohibited in a venerated form? I.e., it's not just saying don't do this, but there's some veneration. Veneration meaning something show that it's, it's a great issue with it, and that what shows that it's something great. Basically, what Ibn Abbas basically said: all the things, either the punishment in this world, or you get the, you gain the, uh, uh, the, the 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 curse of Allah, the anger of Allah, you get a, you get hellfire, right? So you know, there's a difference between saying don't do this, and difference between saying if you do this in the hellfire forever. There's a difference between the two, right? So Shaykh Rasimi basically has tried to summarize that definition, make it as concise as possible. Okay? All are correct. All are generally yani, correct. It's just how much detail and how longer you want it to be. Right, we have another issue which is the next issue, question. How many major sins are there? Uh, how many are there? Seven. 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 Anyone else got the answer? 700. 700. 700. Allah The answer is there's no specified number. A lot of people think there are there, there are seven. Why? Because of the one hadith of Prophet said, it's Tanibu al Mubiqat. Stay away from the seven deadly matters. And the seven major sins. They mentioned seven, seven sins. But yes, in that hadith there are seven, but there's so many other hadith as well. Alright? Um, we are not able to put a particular number on it. And the ulama differ on the number. Okay? Um, some have said 70. Right? Ibn, Ibn Abbas who was asked that question. He said, are the major sins seven? He said, here in the Sabaina Aqrab. It is closer to 70. It is closer to 70. But if you look at some of the books of the ulama later, you'll find that they um, gathered so many more. Al Hafiz al Zahabi, Al Imam al Zahabi, he has a book called Kabair, Major Sins. Likewise, Ibn Hajar al Haythami. Ibn Hajar al Haythami. He has a book, it's different to Ibn Hajar al Asqalani. It's a different Ibn Hajar. Yeah? Ibn Hajar al Haythami. He's got a book called Al Zawajir an al Kabair. Al Zawajir an al Kabair. And in his book, he mentioned. More than 460 major sins. He mentioned more than 460 major sins. Okay, so I mentioned two books to you. These are you know, two of the main books when it comes to major sins. Somebody wants to study the major sins, then you can study these books. Uh, from the two, Wallahu Alam, I've seen Imam Zahabi's book being taught more. That was taught in Nelson a few months ago, I believe, uh, and so on. Right. The next page is blank for some reason. Don't know why it's blank. Let me get rid of that page. <laughs> right. Okay. What are the beliefs of Ahl Sunnah regarding 
major sins. So we've taken like an introduction regarding uh, sins being split into major and minor. What is a major sin and how many are there? Now, what is the belief of Ahlul Sunnah regarding major sins? The belief of Ahlul Sunnah regarding major sins can be summarized into four points. It can be summarized into four points. The first is that those that commit major sins and sins generally, it decreases the Iman. And the person who commits major sins is in grave danger. Is in grave danger. No, no, same point. So major sins and sins generally decrease a person's Iman and they are in grave danger. Meaning, the reason we've added that is we don't want you to think that a oh, major sin right, is sins, okay, but I'm fine, like there's no problem. No, no, you're still upon grave danger. Right? And and it could lead a person to kufr. Right? You can add this to the same point. It could lead a person to disbelief. Eventually lead a person. But in of itself, it doesn't cause a person to disbelief. Yeah? And uh, what do I mean by that? You know the famous hadith of Prophet where he mentioned that every time you do a sin, there's a black dot upon your heart until your heart becomes fully black and hardened. Imagine you made your sins and you're doing that, 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 and your heart is fully black and hardened, then it's very easy for a person to fall over and fall into kufr compared to a person who stays away from major sins. Okay? And that's why some of the Salaf, they said here, you fear sins and I fear kufr. What does that mean? I feel a kufr. Yani, you just fear doing a sin or not doing a sin. I'm looking beyond that. I'm looking beyond that. I'm looking at, if I keep doing sins, that could cause me to, you know, if, if I become negligent with the sins, and that becomes my norm, then the next step is what? Kufr. That's the next step. That like we talked about, you know, playing with the boundary. Right? If you're already far from the major sins, then you, you, you don't have to worry about kufr. That's all the way down there. Right? But if you're playing around with sins and major sins all the time, then kufr is a lot closer. Right, the second point is that the person who commits a major sin is still a believer. He's not considered a kafir. The second point is, so the first point is that it decreases the Iman. And the second point is, la yakfur. He's not a disbeliever. He's still a Muslim. Obviously, we just added extra points to the first one just to clarify. We don't want anyone to think, oh yeah, it's fine to do major sins. The second point is, is that he's still a believer. The third point is that on the day of judgment, he will be taht al under the will of Allah. He will be taht al under the will of Allah. What does that mean? On their judgment, if Allah wants to punish him, Allah can punish him because he's done the sin. But if Allah wants to forgive him, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can forgive him as well. If Allah wants to forgive him due to his mercy, due to intercession, due to whatever reason it may be, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can forgive that person as well. And then the fourth, <coughs> the fourth is, if a person is punished in the hellfire for the major sin, if he is punished, he will not remain in there forever. So the, first, the fourth point is if a person is punished for major sin, he will not remain in there forever. So if you did a major sin, you've killed somebody. On the day of judgment, what's going to happen to you? Uh, tell me. You've killed somebody now. Unjustly. And what's going to happen? Under the way of Allah. Uh, if you repent, though. Uh, if you repent, obviously, uh, Allah forgive you. But we're saying, let's say you don't repent, standing in front of Allah. What's going to happen? Allah can either, if He wants to punish you, punish you. And if Allah, due to His infinite mercy or uh, the intercession of somebody or uh, something else, if He wants to forgive you, He can forgive you as well. If Allah decides to punish you, then what does the fourth, fourth point say? You will not remain in the hellfire forever. As long as you've established Tawheed, you will not remain in the hellfire forever. You'll be punished according to the amount of sin that you've done. Eventually, you'll be taken out of the hellfire. Is that understood? Yeah, so these four points can summarize what Ahlul Sunnah believe regarding major sins. It decreases your iman, doesn't take you out of the fold of Islam, and their judgment you'll be under the will of Allah. And if you are punished, then uh, eventually you will be taken out as long as you've established tawhid. Right so now you may ask. Like, 
lie about the scriptures. That's a major sin, lying about the scriptures, major sin. Ahl al-Kitab, disbelievers. We're talking about people, Muslims, that commit major sins. Uh, I don't fully understand the version. Class, ask, ask me after. Ask, ask me I want to finish this, inshallah. Right. Um, the next question is after mentioning the uh, belief of Ahl Sunnah, is what's the proof for it? What are the proofs? Now, the reality is the proofs are many. So, the best way we can answer them is just split, divide the proofs and give you uh, the different meanings that are mentioned. So, the first is all of those proofs that show. That whoever does not commit shirk with Allah will enter paradise. Those who do not commit shirk with Allah will enter paradise. Now, so as long as you don't commit shirk with Allah, you affirm to you will enter paradise. And the ahadith and ayat are many. Allah SWT says, I put the reference, the ayah is, in Allah la yaghfiru an shirk bihi wa yaghfiru ma duna thalika liman yasha. Allah will not forgive the one who commits shirk, but Allah can forgive anything other than that. Right? Likewise, the hadith of Prophet Sallam, he says, um, the right of Allah over his slaves is that they worship him alone and don't commit shirk with him. But the right of the slaves of Allah is that if they don't commit shirk with him, then Allah will not punish them. So as long as you don't commit a shirk, you establish tawheed, Allah won't punish you. Right? In regards to major shirk, then that's not forgiven at all. Minor shirk is khilaf. Um, there's also another hadith for Islam where he says, وَمَنْ لَقِيَنِي بِقَرَابِ الْأَرْضِ خَطِيئَةً لَا يُشْرِكُ بِي شَيْئًا لَقِيَتْهُ بِمِثْلِهَا مَغْفِرَةً Whoever meets me with the equivalent of the earth's amount of sins, as long as he has not committed shirk with me, I will forgive all of his sins. So you can see all these hadith are what? Mentioning that if you've not committed shirk with Allah, you will enter fathers. Right? Okay. And then we have number two. The second type of ayat, or second type of proofs, those that mention that a person who establishes Tawheed will not enter the hellfire or if they are to enter, enter the hellfire, they will eventually be taken out of the hellfire. The first one was those ayat that show that those that don't commit shirk with Allah will enter paradise. The second type of ayat, those that affirm Tawheed will not enter the hellfire. Or if they do enter the hellfire, they eventually will be taken out and they won't remain in the hellfire forever. They won't remain in the hellfire. Uh, forever. And I mentioned the hadith for that over here which you can read in your own time. Number three is those texts which clearly establish Iman for people who commit major sins. Those uh, ayat and hadith that clearly establish Iman for those that commit major sins. Are you writing all this down? Huh? What's, what's the first type of Proofs. I mentioned literally a minute ago. Mishir Adam, Mishir Adam. Right. The third is those texts that clearly show or establish Iman for those that commit major sins. So in this ayah over here, it's a long ayah, um, Allah SWT talks about uh, two groups of people fighting one another. Killing one another, that's major sin. What is Allah says? مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ From the believers, call them believers. And also in the next ayah, إِنَّ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ إخوة. The believers are our brothers. So even though they commit major sins by killing one another, Allah still calls them believers. Showing that a major sin does not uh, cause a person to become a kafir. Okay? So quickly I'm going to repeat for you, yeah? Because you're not been writing. The first type of ayat, those uh, first type of proofs, those proofs that show Whoever does not commit shirk with Allah will enter Jannah. The second, those that establish Tawheed will not be in the hellfire. And if they do enter the hellfire, eventually they will leave the hellfire. Right? Uh, if you know, uh, I shall read the hadith because I think Riyadh asked me a question about this. The hadith is there where the Prophet says, I give glad, glad tidings to one who passes away from my nation, not committing shirk with me, Tawheed, he will enter paradise. 
So, um, the Prophet, uh, so Jibreel al Islam said this to the Prophet. So, the Prophet asked Jibreel, he said, um, even if they were to fornicate and steal, commit zina and steal, and he said, even if they were to fornicate and steal. So, even though they commit major sins, still entering into paradise. And the third type, uh, where Allah establishes Iman for those who have committed major sins. Okay. Uh, there's also a hadith. There was a companion of Abdullah, and they used to call him Himar, which means donkey. It's not the best name, but that, that was a nickname given to him. And he used to drink a lot of alcohol. And he used to constantly get punished for it. So he came to the, you know, again. He's going to get punished again. So the Sahaba started to curse him. He was coming back to the Prophet, drink alcohol. And even the person, he would, they would punish him and so on. The Prophet said to him, لا تلعنوه فوالله ما علمت إلا أنه يحب الله ورسوله. Do not curse him. For by Allah, I know I do not know anything except that he loves Allah and His Messenger. It's a major sin. What's he doing? Drink alcohol constantly as well. But the Prophet still firmed iman for him. The fourth type of proofs, those proofs that establish capital punishments for major sins. Those proofs that establish capital punishment for major sins. Right. I'm not going to explain this. I want you guys to try to work up. How does that show that uh, the point that we're trying to make? There's all these different texts that show that if somebody does a major sin, this is the capital punishment for it. And obviously, the capital punishments are different types. It could be execution, it could be chopping the hand off, it could be, you know, whatever it is. It could be giving some money, that's fine. How does that show the belief of Ahl Sunnah regarding major sins? Go on. Because of the definition of Ibn Abbas, where he included major sins being from those Okay, the, that's good. It proves the definition of Ibn Abbas because he mentioned capital punishment. The, that's not the point we're trying to prove here. We're not proving the definition, we're proving the belief of Ahl Sunnah regarding it. Christians come to Allah and they're allowed to steal. Oh, like, uh, like worship Jesus. Like they worship it's not the exact answer. You're close, though. You're close. No. no. What it shows is that if it was kufr, if, it, if a major sin did, uh, it was kufr, then there's no need for capital punishment. Because somebody apostates, you kill him anyway. You know, obviously on the uh, Islamic law and the rulings and everything like that, in case anyone takes a video of context, right? Uh, but generally, there would be no need to put a capital punishment. If a major sin was kufr, then khalas. Everyone knows the ruling for it. Everyone knows the ruling for it. But the fact that it's not kufr, it doesn't take a person out of the fall of Islam, then uh, there's these different capital punishments. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Yeah? No, I don't, if any of you guys kept that, yeah, kept that part, yeah. You know, Allah didn't listen. Right. Enjoy. Um, number five. Those texts which talk about Shafa'ah, intercession. Because intercession uh, is different types, and from the types of intercession, is those who have entered paradise, uh, sorry, those who have entered hellfire. And to be taken out of the hellfire. Those from the Muhyiddin, those who had Tawheed, will be taken out from the hellfire. So it shows that they won't be there forever. And especially, especially, there's a hadith of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi where he says, وَشَفَاعَتِي لِأَهْلِ الْكَبَائِرِ مِنْ أُمَّتِي My intercession will be for those who have committed major sins from our Ummah. I.e., they won't remain in the hellfire forever. Yeah? No. It's Shafa'a intercession. Shafa'a is intercession. Shafa is intercession. Okay, so you can see there's these five different types of uh, text. In, in under each category, there comes so many uh, types, which we can, inshallah, uh, you know, I mentioned at least one or two for each one, uh, and there's many others. 
With the Alhamdulillah, we finished the explanation regarding Iman. So we finished everything regarding Iman. It was a bit of a longer explanation. I think we took three lessons just on explaining Iman and issues pertaining to Iman. But Alhamdulillah, this will be one of the more detailed. In terms of the belief of Ahlul Sunnah, Alhamdulillah is a very, very detailed explanation. In terms of the other sects, we didn't go into everything. But this should be like a solid foundation for you when it comes to Iman. So now, if you remember, which hadith are we on? Hadith Jibreel, right? We come back to Hadith Jibreel. Uh, the Prophet ﷺ was asked, فَأَخْبِرْنِي عَنِ Iman, Inform me about Iman. So we just talked about Iman. For next week, we're going to talk, we'll start talking about the pillars of Iman. The Prophet ﷺ said, أَن تُؤْمِنَ بِاللَّهِ وَمَلَائِكَةِ وَكُتُبِي to believe in Allah and His angels to the end of the six pillars. We're going to start going through the pillars of Iman, uh, inshaAllah. Okay? So we will we'll continue next week. Subhanakallah, Subhanakallah, Alhamdulillah, 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 Alhamdulillah,